Good to see you guys here. We will open to Acts uh, chapter 8 uh, as we continue our study in our series. Um, thank you, Brother Yuri, for sharing that. Um, I mean, just, uh, just an incredible testimony of what's happening in Haiti. Uh, and yeah, we did kind of like, what's going on with the hair? I mean, would you cut your hair for Jesus today? <laughs> you did, man. That's awesome. But some of us are like, dude, like there's... So much, so much product. It's an investment. Um, but <laughs> that's awesome. We're, we're going to read from Acts chapter 8. Uh, we're actually going to cover the second half of the chapter. Uh, Mosley Collins, when he comes next Sunday, and he's going to speak here, he's, uh, he's going to speak on the first half of the chapter. So we're going to start from verse 26. Let's read the passage, and we'll come back and, and break it down a little bit. Uh, from verse... 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. And we have a direct quote here from Isaiah. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or, or about somebody else? And then Philip opened his mouth and began, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water, what prevents me from being baptized? If you've got a different version for me, I'm in ESV, you've got a verse there uh, that says something along the lines, hey, if you have faith, let's do it. And then verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. And Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Um, I, I want to start with a story, but it's very similar to, to what Yuri was talking about. An anthropologist came down to a Central America tribe um, that had been discovered, that uh, actually missionaries had gone down there and began to work with this tribe for years and years, and they turned from being just complete, just savages, people that lived and, and, and by the blood and uh, just a brutal, brutal uh, lifestyle. And thank goodness there, there were some people that risked their lives to go down there and work with folks like that, and they came to Jesus. So an anthropologist goes down to these guys, and he sees the work that the missionaries are doing there, and he kind of studies their lifestyle. And uh, you know, on the last day as he's about to fly out of there, he says to the chief and said, listen, man, it's, it's incredible. I've enjoyed spending time with you guys here, seeing your lifestyle. Uh, but, man, it's, it sure is a pity that these missionaries have come here and taught you this faith and poisoned you guys with this religious stuff. And uh, the chief kind of looks at this guy and says, well, let me show you something. You see this rock over here? Well, before the missionaries came, we took people like you and we would tie them to this rock and beat them to death. And you see that tree over there? Well, that's where we would take you then and tie you there and burn you alive sometimes as a sacrifice to the deities that we used to worship. You guys get the message? Man, this world needs Jesus. This world needs Jesus. Jesus. 
And when we get into this chapter here in Acts 8, as we see the church growing, right? In the beginning, uh, we know there's some persecution going along, right? People are being forced out of Jerusalem. That's kind of where the church started. If we go back and remember the story, it started in Jerusalem. There's persecution by a man named Saul, who was a priest, a young guy on fire. He gets permission, begins to persecute the church. And what happens, people begin to spread out and kind of leave Jerusalem, go to other cities, and, and spread spread the faith with them and beginning to go out to other nations and begin to speak to them um, and people begin to be converted. Now, Philip at this time, he's a deacon of the church. He's, he's still in Jerusalem. He hasn't left yet, but we begin to see that Philip in the first half of chapter 8, he's going to go up to Samaria and witness to them. And here he's back and he's going to get in visit from the angel. Now, really quickly before we dive in, I'm going to hit three points today. I tried to make it really easy and make it rhyme so you guys could take notes. If you have a bulletin that our uh, greeters had so graciously provided you guys, feel free to take notes. I love it when, when we take notes. I take a lot of notes myself because that, you kind of go back and, and you find them in your Bible and you, you hit those highlights. So by all means, take some notes. Um, but the, the points we're going to hit are answer the call. There we go. God is for all. And baptism stand tall. It all rhymes. It's like a rap lyric almost, you know. God is for all. And baptism stand tall. Cholesterol <laughs> rhymes. <laughs> uh, no, that's awesome. Uh, go ahead, write those down. And we're going to jump in right away from the first lyric. Answer the call. And that's what we see here. As we begin, we see this picture of, of Philip. He's there. He's in Jerusalem. He's doing ministry. And all of a sudden, an angel appears. And if you're an unbeliever here today, you're like, oh, I'm out, man. These people believing in stuff. I mean, who believes in angels, right? Well, guess what, folks? We do believe in angels. We believe, I'll, I'll, I'll break it down a little bit for us all so we get this right, and I'm not going to focus on this too long, but again, we believe that there is another dimension to this world that we live in, one that we can't grasp, touch, see with our five senses. It is what it is. We can't measure it with scientific instruments that doesn't make it any less real, we believe that in this dimension there reside spiritual beings that can come into our dimension that we can at some time sense them, feel them, they influence our world, but at the same time, they, and they can control things here, but at the same time they are members of that different dimension. We call that the spiritual realm. We believe that happens. Now, God chooses to do most of his work in this world through people, through us, amen? We're doing God's work. Is that the 20%? Amen? All right, we're all here doing God's will. But at times, God will use angels to do his work in places where humans can't go or can't do or do things that are really, really unique. For example, you will hear today many stories of conversion in radically Muslim countries from towns and villages that believers, missionaries cannot go to because, I mean, they would just be killed at the border. But yet these people are coming to Jesus through visions, through dreams, um, through, through, I mean, just appearances of people there, of, of beings that are speaking to them and based on their knowledge of just, I mean, just the little bit that they've got in the, in the Quran and the Torah and some of the things that they believe about most, they're coming to Jesus. Folks, this is, this is true. I'm not making things up right now. These are, there are accurate stories there, and, and maybe at some point we can invite somebody. I know there's even folks in, uh, in Sacramento that have experienced that. This stuff happens, guys. This stuff happens. So an angel of the Lord comes to Philip and says, listen, you've got to answer the call. I've got a mission for you. You're going to go out, and you're going to go to this place and Philip looks it up in, Wiki, in, in Google Maps, and he's like, Jesus, or the angel, this is a desert place. There is nothing there. So to answer the call, for, folks, first of all, we've got to overcome some excuses. We've got to overcome some excuses. The angel doesn't really give him, Philip a lot of detail. He says, just, just go. He doesn't tell him that he's going to meet the eunuch there. He doesn't, he's, just go. It's a desert place, but I need you to go. And you don't see Philip doing the Jonah here, right, where he sprints the other way. He says, all right. 
He doesn't say, God, I've got work to do. I've got stuff. And if it's Sunday, God, you know, there's a football game. I've got to stay home. Watch. He says, no, I'm, I'm ready. You, you speak. I listen. I go. His heart was on fire. Spurgeon has a saying. He said, a burning heart will find a flaming tongue. A burning heart will find a flaming tongue. Sometimes when, when we as a church get called out, uh, when we as maybe individual Christians get called out for not having a flaming tongue, the answer lies within, right? Is my heart on fire? All of us that are here today, folks, let's be honest, we have, we have excuses. I, we could have easily come up with a list of excuses to not be here. Well, I've got homework. Well, I've got work. Well, I've got kids. Well, I've got grandparents to take care of. I've got dishes to do. Well, I, I've only slept seven hours last night. I've got to catch up on another hour, you know? We've got excuses. But yet, we found a way to be here. We're answering the call here, and we should do the same with, um, with the call of Jesus to minister to people. And folks, there's a consequence here. I mean, we know from history, this Ethiopian man is going to go back to Ethiopia and start the Ethiopian church. Can you imagine if Philip said, uh, ain't nobody got time. I got to stay in Jerusalem. None of that would have happened, right? So he answers the call. There's great, uh, there's great things that happen because of it. So the second point of answering the call is God prepared the mission field. So Philip walks out there to this place in the desert. He's, he's in the middle of nowhere. And unexpectedly, the secretary of the treasury of Ethiopia is on his way home with his entourage from Jerusalem. He's driving down there. And it's quite a trip. I don't want you guys to think that it was like the next town over. I mean, Ethiopia is like 1,200 miles away, right? So he came from Ethiopia up, up the Nile through Egypt, Sinai, up into Jerusalem, 1,200 miles. That's a long time. That's a road trip of like a month. And now he's coming back down. He's just left. He's on his way. He's got himself a, the, the, the bestseller in Jerusalem, the book of Isaiah. And he's thumbing through this thing, and he's reading it in, in his chariot, and he, he doesn't get it. He doesn't know what's happening. Now, I don't want to make it, we don't know from this story if the Ethiopian man was just like a devout Jewish guy, if he was a proselyte. We don't know that. Um, he may have been worshiping God along with other gods, like Yuri was saying, right? Hey, I worship God when I do good things, and I worship Satan when I do bad things. Because the African nations, I mean, we, we understand and know that they have been for a long time involved with a lot of um, pagan worship. That involves demonic worship, right? So I, don't, I can't say whether this guy was a devout Jew, but I do know that he was seeking God. He was trying to figure things out. And in Ethiopia, he would have heard the stories of the people of Israel leaving Egypt and all the stuff that happened, the legends of all these, oh man, are there were frogs all over the place. And then the army went after them and the Red Sea divided, but all the people sang. So he would have known some of this stuff. He went, goes up to Jerusalem to find out more about God, to worship him. He's coming back, reading this book, and, and, uh, and Philip sees him here. Philip meets him. He was curious. He wanted to know more about God. And God sends the right person into his life. And Philip, you know, he's, he's, he's there. And um, he gets into the chariot with the guy. And, folks, it's, it's not every day. I mean, you've got the presidential limo driving by. And you're like, hey, dude, mind if I jump in? Like, can I, can I, uh, you, you've got space, right? Um, <laughs> this foreign diplomat's in his limo, and, and Philip just kind of runs up alongside of him like, bro, what are you reading there? Like, I, I, like, I like that book. You mind if we do like a little book club real quick? And that's what happens. Philip sees the opportunity. The angel speaks to him. The spirit says, hey, that's your man. That's why I sent you down there. So he, he runs up, and he, and he takes some interest in this Ethiopian man. Folks, we, we've got... God's prepared the mission field for us. We've got to be out there taking an interest in people's lives. Uh, Dwight Moody tells of a story when he was walking through Chicago one day. I mean, the guy was just like, personal evangelism was his thing. Like, everybody around him figured out that he was a missionary. I mean, that's just the way he was. He's walking down the street, sees this guy kind of 
um, uh, on a corner, depressed. He comes up to him and says, listen, uh, hey, buddy, I'm a pastor. Can I help you out with something? And the guy's like, dude, it's none of your business. And Dwight Moody says, listen, I, I, I hate to offend you, but your life is my business. The life of the people around us is our business as believers, folks. It absolutely is our business. Yuri was just, you know, he's flying on the plane. There's a guy next to him. Listen, his eternal life was Yuri's business. And you took advantage, praise God, right? You were able to speak into his life. Think about the folks that are around you all the time, guys. I mean, are there people in your life, let's be honest, because there are folks in my life where I think, but bro, he's like the president of the company. How, like, how am I going to speak to him? Like, you don't just come up and say, hey, Ron, have a Bible. You need Jesus, man. You know, he's like five levels of hierarchy above me. Let's be honest. There are people in our life that we, we don't want to speak to them because, like, well, what do I do? How do I witness to them? And, and we need to call ourselves out on that a little bit. Their eternal life is our business. And finally, he begins to point back to Jesus. So at this point, Philip's there. Philip's with uh, this Ethiopian in the, in the chariot. And they're reading the scripture together. We're going to look at it again to, from verse 32. Now, the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. And his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. I mean, imagine you're, you're the Ethiopian right now, right? You're, you've got Isaiah, you're, you're thumbing through it, and you come upon this chapter, and you're like, what is going on? I mean, look at this thing. Like they're dragging some dude along like a piece of meat, like a sheep that's about to be killed without a proper trial. He's like, is this like a police report? Is this a homicide report? This is like goosebumps, man. What's going on over here? They're just going to kill this guy. And so, so he's reading this and he's trying to figure out what's happening. Is this Isaiah? Did this happen to, to the author? Is this like his friend? Or is this, who, who's, who are we talking about? This is incredible. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. I mentioned earlier, Isaiah was probably like the bestseller of that time. The, the Jewish nation loved the book of Isaiah. And the reason for that is Isaiah has a lot of prophecies, prophecies being statements that predict the future events, right? They were very specific statements that, that said things that would, would happen in the future. There were promises almost saying, listen, this is the way the situation is now, but, but something's going to happen later on to change the situation. Some of them were good, some of them were bad. But there's a lot of them in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, and so what we see here, he's reading a prophecy. He's reading a prediction of some event that will happen in the future. But here's the thing, guys. What's, what's awesome about the story? This thing was written like 700 years before the time of Philip. And Philip gets in the chariot and looks the Ethiopian right in the eye and he says, Listen, I know this book is old. I know it's been written a long time ago. The crazy thing is this just happened. This murder scene that you just read, I mean, I don't know if he was there, but he had firsthand accounts. He's like, dude, it just happened. It just happened. Like Jerusalem, yeah, you missed it by like a year, by a couple of months. It just happened. He said, what do you mean? Tell me more about it. And, and Philip begins to go back, and he opens up all these other passages. And he's like, dude, look at this passage here in Isaiah. Look at this place. All of this just happened. I mean, I can imagine how excited he was. Folks, here's why we believe in Jesus Christ. Here's why we are here as believers today. Not because we're brainwashed, because we, oh, we've been poisoned by this religion, because we've got nowhere else to be, or, or we're just stupid, right? We're just brainlessly following some sort of a cult. Folks, there, that we have evidence to believe that Jesus Christ is God. And that, thank you. Thank you. Amen. Folks, 
when we look back in the Old Testament, that's the first half of your Bible, right? The first, te- the, the, sorry, did I say the first testament? The Old Testament. You look back at the Old Testament, there are over 335 predictions, prophecies, promises that were predicted in the Old Testament, 700 to 1,000 years before Christ was even born, and Christ fulfilled them all. Guys, do you understand that? Do you under 335, by different authors, different time periods, different things, they predicted about Jesus, and, and here comes along one man who, bam, 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 he just makes all of them happen in his life. And we're not like talking about stuff like he reads it, oh, I gotta do this. Oh, I gotta do this. Like you don't predict where you're born, right? You don't predict what your bloodline is, who your parents are. You can't choose that. And yet, he was born in Bethlehem, just like the prophecy said. You don't predict who your parents are. Oh, well, here is the bloodline of David. Look at, look at that. And then his life, and the miracles, and then the way he dies. Folks, we read here that he's going to be pierced through his hands and through his feet. Old Testament, thousands of years before Jesus came along, before crucifixion was even invented. And look how he died. We read a prophecy. He's going to die. He's going to be pierced. None of his bones are going to be. That's what happened. Like, you don't dictate stuff after your death. By the way, guys, I really need you to, like, like spear me right here. But don't break any of my bones. Like, spear me. Like, you, you don't do that. He was supposed to be buried with the criminals, and instead he was buried in a rich man's tomb. That doesn't just, like, somebody reads that and makes that happen. It was a coincidence that, oh, my goodness. Well, look, there's another prophecy fulfilled. Folks, we have hard evidence here. If any of you have come here today and you were kind of thinking like, man, Christianity, is this thing for me? Is this thing even real? Like, what's going on with that? Maybe maybe just kind of going through a slump in your Christian faith and thinking, I mean, should I even believe? I've just given you that evidence. You've had it in front of you the whole time. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. Amen. There we go. Oh, man, I'm glad, I'm glad we're all on the same page here. Otherwise, we would have had to go through that again. That's awesome. So anyway, the message of Jesus Christ, it's, it's a tricky message to deliver. It's not something you, I mean, luckily this guy was reading the story and, and we had a good starting point with Philip, right? But there's a reason that the Pharisees and the Jewish nation rejected Jesus. Because they, when they looked at these prophecies, they said, well, we want to interpret these prophecies in a way that gives us a strong leader. A, a, a leader that will come and save us not from our sins and from ourselves, but from all of these other people. We don't want to serve the Roman Empire. That's what we want to be saved from, not from the sin that resides in each one of us. And so when Jesus came and this happens to them and he gets beaten and humiliated, they said, well, that's a weak leader. There's no way a God would do that. Folks, I mean, let's be honest. When you, think about, when you think about God, you don't think about God being killed by humans. Like, that's not what God, like, that, oh, classic God being killed by people. You don't think about it that way. You think God is a mighty being right over everything. And, and No, he's not going to be humiliated by people. Why would God do that? So that's the strange. It's not like God, is it? And so, and so they didn't get that piece of it. So they said, well, God must be a strong being, the Savior that's going to come with armies and the kingdom will be risen up and he'll rebuild the temple again. And in all this time, Jesus is saying, listen, you guys completely didn't get that passage. That was about my body, right? Uh, the body of the temple is going to be rebuilt. The kingdom, yeah, I will establish a kingdom for all nations, not just for Israel. You guys are completely misinterpreting these passages to suit your own needs. And so, they rejected him. And that's why we've got this fulfillment of this prophecy in Isaiah. Folks, the gospel is a powerful, powerful message. Powerful, powerful message. I mean, I imagine that the conversation that Philip had with the eunuch went something like this. One, we believe in God. We believe 
that there is a super intelligent, super powerful, all powerful, omnipresent, all seeing, all, all controlling being that, that it just, it is. We believe there is such a being. We believe this being created the universe and people. And if you're saying, well, I don't get that. I don't think that's true. Well, guess what? You're not super intelligent. I'm not saying you're, you're dumb, but I'm just saying you're not God. You know, when you become super intelligent and super powerful that you can control, you know, you'll get it then. But that's what happened, right? He created all of this. Then his creation, humans, the ones that he created in his own being, they rebelled against them. We call that rebellion sin. They rebelled against him. They said, we don't like the way you've made life for us. We're going to live it our own ways. And heck, most of them today don't even believe in a God. Let's be honest, right? So his creation rebels against them. Now, folks, the punishment of sin is death. You rebel against an almighty, I mean, you try to shoot the president, they're going to shoot you on the spot, right? You rebel against the nation, they, they, they'll, they'll kill you for treason. You, you rebel against God, you die. But God sends Jesus. God comes to earth in the form of Jesus Christ to take that punishment on himself, living an innocent lifestyle, dying in Jerusalem, murdered by, by that nation there, dying for our sins in order to be resurrected again. And he lives today, amen? amen. Folks, that's the message of the gospel. Every person here today is guilty of being a rebel against God. Everybody. You have sin in your life. It's nothing new. Look around. So does everybody else. But God loves you. God can forgive you through the blood of Jesus Christ if you accept his death and if you accept him as Lord. That's the message of the gospel, and that's what we call, talk about when we say answer the call and share the message with other folks. Now, second point. God is for all. God is for all. Uh, this is such a relevant message right now for folks right now. Guys, uh, I mean, you read the news over the last year, and we see, I mean, I grew up, I thought racism was dead, and then we get Ferguson, right? And we get this Black Lives Matter movement, and, and you see people being persecuted for being Middle Eastern or being uh, Hispanic. I mean, just you, you see all of that cropping up again, and you think, God, this is sin. This isn't right. That's not how you created the world, but we as humans corrupt it. If there was ever a passage that, that preached against racism, and, and we don't speak on this very often, uh, but this passage speaks on it, so we will mention it. This is it. God teaches acceptance of all nations, of all peoples, of all languages. He says, accept it. If you look at Acts 2, they speak multiple languages. Beginning of Acts 8, he works in Samaria. They're half Jewish, half something else. You don't know, Middle Eastern. Acts 10, he speaks to a Roman centurion. He's like Greek or Italian, right? European. And here, second part of Acts 8, he's speaking to the African nation, right? So God is out there, and he's saying, through his spirit, I'm proving to the church, you're going to go out, you're going to reach all nations, all continents, all kinds of peoples. I want them all in the kingdom. They're going to be there. Because guess what? For God, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Hashtag Russian Lives Matter. Hispanic Lives Matter. What other country? Asian lives, right? They matter. Did I miss anybody? German lives. For our German band leader. You matter. All love. You know? God says, listen, let's bring this together. You're all one people. You're all my kids. You need to accept each other, right? I, I love you all. There's nothing, there's nothing along national lines that should separate us. And it's a, it's a shame, it's such a shame when we let nationality dictate who we love. People above nationality. Souls above nationality. That's what God kind of leaves for us, right? And it's not just about when we say God is for all. Uh, we don't just look at nationality. We don't just look at nationality. Folks, uh, Look at how different Philip and Ethiopian, the Ethiopian was. Like two such different men, right? Philip, he's a common man, just simple guy, 
not very rich, right? Jewish. We do know he lo- he's low income because he walks everywhere, right? He doesn't have a ride. He walks around. So just a common guy, Jewish, right, uh, lives in Israel. Look at the Ethiopian. The guy's rich. He's got the chariot, right, which is the Escalade of those days. Nice car. He's respected. He's an official. He's, he's black. He's Ethiopian. Uh, he's a eunuch. Kids, if you don't know what that is, ask your parents. <laughs> We're not going to go into the details. Um, but, but he was medically disabled, if I can say it that way, right? So and that was part of the job description. You know, you, hopefully you read the fine print and, and you understood what you were getting into. But that's, that's, that's who this man was. Two such different people, and God brings them together and said, listen, I need you both to be in the kingdom. You're both the kind of people I want. And so, folks, race and nationality aside, there's nothing that you can be. There's no lifestyle you can live today where God doesn't say, I still want you. There is no lifestyle you can be living today where God doesn't still say, I can make things right. You need to come to me right now. If you think about, well, listen, I'm suffering from addiction. We understand. We we've seen people that are alcoholics in the Bible. And God still wants them. He calls them and makes things right. Abusive personalities, God turns them around. Adulterers, murderers, God takes them and just changes their life and then later says, this is a man of my own heart. I changed that life. Well, gay, lesbian, well, that's, that's called sexual immorality. God works with people like that. Transgender, well, listen, this guy was medically altered. We'll put it that way, right? There was a pastor, I, I remember, this is five or six years ago. He said, listen, well, he has a church out in Arizona, uh, Colorado, actually, uh, a church out in Colorado, and this woman comes up to him after the service and said, Pastor, I want to talk to you. Your sermon really touched me. I want to accept Jesus Christ. Uh, I want to ask you something, though. I wasn't born a, a woman. I was born a man, and I had some surgery done. Um, what do I do? Can Jesus still accept me? He said, one, yes, absolutely. Absolutely he can accept you. You've got to repent. You've got to come to Jesus, be baptized. And Jesus will accept you, and we'll figure the rest of it out as we go along. Man, there's nothing in your life that could have happened that Jesus won't accept you and say, let's go, let's go. Jesus has washed all that sin away. We need to change our life around. We need to do, make things right. And so that's what's going on here where we see Philip talking to this man and bringing him to Jesus. And and look what happens as we read. And as they were going along the road, uh, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And so the next point and the last point is, in baptism, stand tall. In baptism, stand tall. There's a reason for baptism. So the, the Ethiopian, he's, he's with Philip. He, he goes through the gospel and he gets it. The, he just gets it. He's like, I understand now what I need to do, what needs to happen. And he pulls over at the first oasis there in the desert. And an oasis in the desert is a packed place. It's not like they were out there by themselves. There's people there. There's like a trough or the camels to drink. And this guy in his suit just dives right in. He's like, I need to get baptized. And we think, well, why? Like, what's, what's, what's baptism all about? Like, why do you need to get into the water to prove that you love Jesus? Why can't you just be a Christian, right? We have a lot of questions about that, and that's why it kind of the last part of this message, I wanted to focus on baptism specifically. Why do we baptize? Why do you have to get into the water, have somebody, like, say some words, get dunked, to prove that you love Jesus. Why can't you just like love Jesus? Why can't you just like live a good life? Why do you do that? Well, good question. I'm glad you asked. Um, We're going to break it down a little bit. So let's start with the beginning. What is baptism? Baptism in itself, the word baptismo in Greek, and and it means to to be washed, 
to be sprinkled with water. So it, it does have something to do with water. Now, it's not like a Christian term. It's not like the Southern Baptist. Is like, we, we coined it. It's our deal. Uh, it actually, it's not, it doesn't just start with Christianity at all. Other religions baptized. Pagan religions baptized. Sometimes it was with water. Sometimes it was with blood. They would sprinkle you with blood or dunk you in blood. It was a way of washing yourself before their deities. That was the way they did things. Now, the Jewish nation did it for, for several reasons, for washing of themselves. And, and the fact that they w w washed themselves so often and, and baptized themselves so often actually helped them survive the bubonic plague. That's a cool little side fact. That one's for free. Um, uh, but it's, it's just a cool, cool thing, man. And, you know, God gives them this law, and this law protected them for so many ages uh, it, to, to live a way that, that, I mean, God was with them. So anyway, it was used by other religions. It was used by the Jews uh, to, to wash themselves, ritual, pu ritual pur purification. And then Jesus comes along, and he kind of turned things around. Now, a lot of times you would just baptize yourself. Fact. John the baptizer... John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, was known as John the Baptizer because he got in the pool with the people. Like, dude, what are you doing here? I'm baptized. No, I'm going to baptize you. Like, let me do it. Let me show you how it's done. So that's why he was known John the Baptizer, because he would get in the pool and make things personal and be like, no, 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 no. Let's do it together. I want to pray with you. I want this to be like a thing where other people are involved. Because baptism shouldn't be a solitary one-on-one -on -one thing. You go home and take a shower. No, it, it, it's a public testament, right? And so that brings us into the reasons for baptism. Christ redeems baptism, this washing, right? It goes from just being purification or some sort of a ritual you did by yourself somewhere. Now it becomes something else. He takes this and says, we're going to do this publicly for everybody to see as a profession of your faith. Well, why is that? Why do I have to do that? Well, well, several reasons. So let's put it this way. Yeah, two purposes of baptism. Thank you, video team, for moving me along. Public profession of faith, and second, initiation into the church. Two reasons for baptism. Public profession of faith, initiation into the church. First of all, public profession of faith. When you became a believer, you, you, you're transformed inside. We know that. The Holy Spirit resides. God, the Holy Spirit, comes out. He lives inside of us. He is responsible for all the good that we do, the good intentions, for, for changing people from the inside where an alcoholic can just the next instant no longer desire alcohol. As somebody who's been abusive all of their life, God transforms them and makes them into a new person. That happens. It's supernatural. It's evidence of God living here amongst people, folks. So that happens. The second step of that is baptism, where we profess it before other people. I, a, a friend of mine, a pastor friend, was, was telling me about a guy that, that came to him, and he was just so proud. He said, listen, nobody at work knows yet that I'm a Christian. How long have you been? Oh, years. I've been a Christian for years. But, man, I've been pretty good at hiding it. So proud. I'm like, no, that's... It's the opposite of what Jesus taught. Like, that's the bad thing. You want people to know that you're a Christian. You want people to know that you believe that your life has changed, that you're a new person, not thanks to a self-help book, but because of God. We need that in this world. The world needs God. We established that from the beginning. And so that's what it is. When we get baptized, while conversion and repentance comes internally, secretly inside of us. Baptism is that public element where we pronounce to the world and show to the world in a public gesture saying, I am now a believer. I am no longer who I was. I have been changed, and here is this public gesture. I want you to know, friends, family, the world, I am now a believer. I follow God. I believe in God, and by the way, you should too. That is the purpose uh, the first purpose. The second part is the initiation into the church. Initiation into the church. When, when you baptized, you became part of the local, of the local church congregation. We remember when, when Paul, right, he was converted out there on the road, and then uh, Ananias had to come and, and, and pray over him and baptize him, and he became a believer.
believer, right? It was a sign. Hey, no, I saw him. He was baptized. He was good. He's one of us now. He did it. It's right. And baptism, there's, there's a passage. I want to make sure we grab this. Write this down. Romans 6, 1, 4, if you don't read it right now. 6, uh, 6 1, and the first four uh, verses. Um, baptism gives us that strength now. You're part of the church. You've shown that. You've indicated that. And it gives you strength to fight those battles. Right? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul writes, Romans 6, 1 through 4. By no means. Right? Paul is saying here, listen, there are some people that think I've been, I have grace. God forgives everything, so I should go on and sin some more. I should continue to live my lifestyle. Paul says, no way. You don't get it. What that means is something different. How can we who have died in sin, died to sin, still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Basically, what's that, what that is saying, just to break it down, right? Simple words. He's saying, when you were baptized, when you were baptized, that was a sign to you and to the world that you have died to your former life and that you are a new person now. And so people will look at you and say, dude, you're a Baptist, right? Like, did, weren't you baptized? Or whatever denomination, but I saw you baptized, right? Like, how could you do something like that? And it reminds us also, when we go outside of the will of God, when we live a lifestyle that's not right, we go back and think, listen, I shouldn't be doing this. Like, this is, this is not who I am anymore. I've been baptized. Jesus has died for me and washed my sins. I can't look at myself in the mirror. Who am I anymore, right? Like, no, this is not me. I can't. I've got to stop. We get strength from that. That's our motivation. We're living in a way um, that is right in this world, that is pleasing to God. And folks, I, again, baptism is so, so important. Um, it's, I mean, I know some denominations and religions make it optional, and it's like, well, you, if you want to do it, we'll do it, you know, but there's a water shortage, so, you know. Uh, it, it's not optional. We, we've got to do it. And the importance, that, oh, we've honestly, and I, I know I've spoken on this before, but I'm going to repeat this next part um, because it's important for all of us to remember this. We in Christianity here in America, we live in abnormal Christian life. The way we live here in America is not the way Christianity is usually lived. Usually, what happens when you become a believer in any third world country today, people don't like you anymore because you've stopped following the desires of your heart and what you want to do and live the sinful lifestyle that they live, and you want to be, oh, you're, what, you're better than us now? Oh, you think you're better than us now. Right? You've separated yourself away from sin. You've become holy in the eyes of God. And that's a good word, guys. That's a, we want to be holy. We want to be without sin. You've become different from folks. Your life has changed, and publicly you've professed it. And so here's what happens. If you're in a Muslim country, you die. They find you, and they kill you. And guess who kills you first? Your parents are the ones that throw the first rock at you. I mean, if, if there, there are some videos out there of, of public stonings. Guys, uh, it'll make your blood curl when the family gathers around their kid that had just accepted Christianity, and the dad will be the first one to take the biggest stone he can and launch it at this girl's head. That's what happens when you're a Christian. Today. That's not 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. Today. That happens. When Christians in North Korea are pulled, put under steamrollers. Oh, Yeah. Our spies told us that there was a public baptism and you were baptized. That's what happens today. South, I mean, just Africa in general, uh, where Christians um, are attacked by and just other people in neighboring villages, burned, mutilated. I mean, uh, or even not that bad, but like you go down to some of these Central American countries. And you know what? It, hey, if you think you're a Christian, that's, that's fine. Do it your thing. They're cool with you. But once you've been baptized, oh, now you're in that cult. Now you're one of them. 
and your family doesn't want to have anything to do with you because you're that weird guy in the family that believes in Jesus and God. And that's what happens when you get baptized. And so when folks today think, well, I've just got, I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll go join that church. I'll be baptized into your religion. That's unusual. That's not the right way it should be, man. Because in any other moment, what would happen is in communist Russia, you get baptized on a Friday. By Monday, the KGB's knocking at your door and saying, listen, we've got a nice cold cell for you in Siberia. Let's go. That's what happens. So what we live is abnormal. But there's real meaning and real depth to the understanding of professing your faith before everybody so that they would know. I'm going to finish with the story again. I've told it a couple of times before, but it's so powerful. I'm going to repeat it again, and we're going to pray after this. It's about a missionary that went down. uh, This is in Africa, actually. They they were out in in some of the tribes. Um, And she, she goes out to a neighboring village. She's been working in her kind of patch of territory for a while, but she goes out to a neighboring village where uh, just a young guy right out of seminary had come in, began work with the people, uh, being a pastor there, telling people about Jesus. And you know what? Three guys raised their hand and said, I want to accept Jesus. I want to change my life around. I reject my old life. I reject the sin I've lived. I want to be a believer now. And so he grabs them. They set up a place for baptism, and it's Africa. There's no water. So they've got to dig this, like, shallow well, fill it up with water, um, and and they were going to have to kind of squat down there while he baptized them. And so she kind of comes over, and she's she's watching this and uh, watching this go on. And so the first guy comes out, and again, maybe some family, some friends, some interested people from the village are there. And so he takes the first guy and says, hey, do you believe in Jesus? The guy says, yes, I do. And he takes him and dunks him under the water and brings him up. And the guy is just ecstatic. He comes up, he takes a huge breath, and he just begins to scream and jump for joy. He's just, he just couldn't be happier. He jumps out. All of his family's like, what? You're baptized now. That's awesome. They take the second guy. Same thing. Hey, do you believe? He dunks him. The guy jumps up. He's just as happy. He's, you know, his family's happy to see him. They embrace him. Third guy, same thing. And she's like, well, I've never seen anybody this happy to be baptized. That's awesome. So she goes talk to the young missionary. She's like, dude, what'd you, what'd you tell him that made him so happy? He said, I- I'm, I'm trying to explain this to them, uh, but I think they misunderstood something. Well, I was reading Romans chapter 6. We read it a little bit earlier, and I said, you have to be baptized into the death of Jesus I think they understood that when I was going to baptize him, I was going to kill him. <laughs> I think they, were, they thought they were going to die. And so when they came up, their family was happy to see that they survived. That's why they were so happy. And, and she laughs. She laughs just like you guys, but he stops her and says, hey, hey, listen up. Would you be baptized today if you knew you were going to die? They thought they were going to be killed, and they got baptized. Would you do that today? Folks, we're going we're gonna to pray here in a second, but I want to just, again, hit, hit some of the main points. Answer the call. We have received the call from God to go and speak into the lives of people. There are people that are suffering around us. Bright Broderick, West Sacramento, friends and family, partners at work, schoolmates. We've got to answer the call. They need us. God is for all. Acceptance. God wants everybody to come to him. And secondly, in baptism, stand, uh, third, in baptism stand tall. Folks, it, it's, it's an important part of your Christian walk before God. There are people today that will die for Jesus. They will profess their faith and they will die for Jesus. And, and we kind of almost like, oh, do I really need it? Do I, what, what's that all about? Folks, this is serious stuff. When we follow Jesus, when we take that seriously, when we understand that there is a God, there is Jesus, when we die, we're going to meet him. If we don't, there's another place waiting for us, right? But if we understand that and take that very seriously, that puts us all in front of a decision. And I know many of you are baptized. Praise God. You've accepted Jesus. Praise God. But if you're here today, you're faced with that decision, guys. I want to make that very clear. It's either Jesus or it's eternity without Jesus. 
Let's, let's stand. Let's pray. I want to call the band up, please. And then we're going to worship because we've got a lot to be thankful for. As, as Brother Paul had said earlier, uh, we do have salvation. We do have a God that loves us. We do have Jesus, the Son of God, that came down and lived and died for us. And then we have God, the Holy Spirit, that lives in us. So we're going to pray. Uh, let's cl- bow our hearts, close our eyes, just come before God right now. Um, I pray that all of you just kind of pray in your hearts as well as we come before God in worship, but in this prayer as well. Father, thank you so much for the death of Jesus Christ. That you, God, would humiliate yourself to come before us as humans who are nothing in the big picture, God. You would come down and die Uh, a death that uh, it was just horrendous uh, when we read about it, just unfair, unjust, so wrong in so many respects. But you went through that for us because you love us. You're just mad about us, man. You want us and you desire us. Father, um, there's so many people out there that don't understand that today. They don't understand that they're loved by just an all-powerful, all-knowing God, they think they're out there by themselves. They think there's no hope. God, I pray that you give them hope in their hearts today, knowing that there is somebody that loves them and wants them and needs them and calls them today. I pray that we can deliver that message to others. And I pray for those people that are ready to make the decision today that they would make that step forward um, and, and receive baptism. I mean, that's, that's important. We need to profess our faith before this world. May your name be praised as we lift you up in worship. Amen.